Uh, we're going to hear from a few people this morning, but before we start, Des Martinez is here with me and she's going to do a land acknowledgement for us. Let us recognize that every member of the San Jose community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the original people. As we join here today, it is vitally important that we recognize the history of the land on which we walk on. We also recognize that the Muwakama Olone people are alive and flourishing members of the broader Bay Area. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather here today in San Jose sits on unceded ancestral homeland of the Miwakama Olone, who are the original people of San Francisco Bay Area. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland, and we affirm their sovereign rights as the first peoples. Thank you. going to come up in a couple of minutes with just a, a few things about today. There's uh, some wellness things happening. Who went to yoga? Did folks go to yoga this morning? Was it great? Uh, there'll be yoga again tomorrow and later this afternoon there's something called sound bathing. If you've never tried sound bathing you should go and check that out. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and the art show uh, that you, I'm sure that many of you have looked at runs along this wall. It's works that are comprised of people that are currently incarcerated in San Quentin or who are homeless in, locally in our community or have been homeless here. Uh, all of the pieces are for sale, but what I wanted to share, and the proceeds go to the artists. Uh, I thought yesterday was a great day. Did everyone have a good time? when we're really going to uh, uh, get to hear from so many leaders, so many amazing workshops, the presenters, everything to me, it's like hard to choose what to go and watch and learn from. And so I hope everyone has a really good day. And I really uh, uh, like at this time to bring up my, my friend Donald Whitehead, who, yep, he's... He and NCH have been such an inspiration to us at Destination Home, and it has really been an honor for us to get to have this opportunity to learn uh, from your legacy and all of the work that you've done to support our lived experience communities for so long. So, thanks, Donald. Good morning. Okay, we can do better than that. Good morning. So um, I just want to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's amazing to see so many people here uh, that have had the experience of homelessness and our friends who may not have had the experience but truly care about uh, those that have had the experience. Um, I, I'm not going to say this with hyperbole, but this is absolutely the most important conference that happens in the homeless sector every year. Um, you have proven, and it's all because of you, you've proven uh, that people experiencing homelessness are really the most important element in ending homelessness. Uh, there, there was this idea a few years back that uh, we should involve people experiencing homelessness and a lot of people checked off a box, but what we're seeing now is there's authentic engagement. Uh, people are really becoming uh, essential to the homeless delivery system in their community, and we're changing the system. And please give yourselves a round of applause for that. I wanted to first take some time to thank our partners uh, at Destination Home. Uh, it, we've been doing conferences uh, way back uh, uh, since uh, 1982, was when we did our first conference. For some reason, over that time, uh, we had never done one on the West Coast. Uh, we, we, for some reason, hadn't done that. Uh, we've been in Denver, we've been in Minnesota, uh, we've been in, in Dallas, but we never made it to California. And uh, we are so grateful that 
uh, after last year's conference, and I, I want to uh, single out uh, Khadiz Tapili. Um, she came to our conference last year. And what she shared is that she was so moved by the idea that people with lived experience um, are the focus, the feature, and are treated with such dignity. Uh, she went back to the idea that we needed to do one in California, and she uh, has gone above and beyond, and then above and beyond again to put this together. And I just really want to give her a great round of applause. For, for her. Uh, the rest of Destination Home staff has been incredible. Uh, we really have appreciated all that they brought to the table. We could not have done this without them. Uh, and we are just truly grateful. I would um, say everyone's name, but I know I'm going to forget some. Uh, but Jennifer Loving, absolutely. Uh, and I also want Phil, who has done all of our logistics. I really thank him for his incredible work. And I also want to thank the NCH staff. Um, the NCH staff, uh, talking about going above and beyond. Everybody here is here because Megan Hustings arranged your transportation. Um, we also have a couple of board members from NCH here. If you don't mind standing for a second, if you're an NCH board member. Um, I know there's a few in the room. Uh, and, 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 so thank you very much. So all of, all of the thank yous out of the way, I really want to say that this is, this is an amazing gathering. Uh, I see a lot of very familiar faces, but more importantly, I see a lot of new faces. And this is, a, this is not um, uh, just uh, fun and games, if you will. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Uh, you'll hear from people uh, that have been doing the work for a while that has some amazing products for you to copy, for you to replicate, for you to make your own, take back to your community, and really give us the opportunity to end homelessness in America. Because we can do it. Homelessness is solved. And I... I also have some homework for you. Um, the, the way we end it is we have to organize, we have to mobilize, and we have to force change. So for the last 40 years, now this period of homelessness that we're in is the longest period of homelessness continuously in the history of the United States. So we've had four periods of homelessness. This is the longest period in our history, and the, the other periods of homelessness were reduced are ended in some cases because there was a dramatic investment by our federal government. And that investment came because people demanded that it would come. Uh, we know that power concedes nothing without protest. Now I'm not saying everybody needs to go and march, and although that would be a good idea as well, but, but you have to start protesting, you have to start pushing our elected officials to do the work that's necessary to end homelessness in America. And I'm going to ask all of you to join our campaign. It's called the Bring America Home Now campaign. Uh, we have to build a movement to end homelessness. The providers can't do it by themselves. We can't do it by ourselves, but together we can. Homelessness is solvable if we come together to do it. So your charge after this conference is to sign on for the Bring America Home campaign so we can end homelessness in the richest country in the world work once and for all. So I welcome you all. I thank you for being here. I know some of you have come a really long way. And I know you didn't come just to hear me. I know you want to hear some of our other fantastic speakers, uh, and, and I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, he is uh, just an amazing individual. Um, he is my brother, really, um, uh, in this work, uh, and, and I have grown to love him as a friend uh, and admire all the amazing work he's doing. Um, Dr. Lamont Green. tell you a little bit about Dr. Lamont Green. He's been working uh, on homeless issues for over 20 years now. Uh, he has worked for TAC, um, the, the Technical Assistance Collaborative, 
we actually did a project uh, where we were able to promote racial equity throughout this entire state of California, and he led that project. Uh, he's also worked very hard uh, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, he actually, uh, with that organization, uh, does a lot of technical assistance. He also works with the, the Veterans Administration um, and just does an amazing amount of work. Now his group in Washington State was one of the first groups to get direct money to combat homelessness as a lived experience group. And they set the bar for all of us. And he is also a board member, as I said, for the National Coalition. Uh, I'm not going to hold him up anymore because he is absolutely an amazing speaker. So please give yourself, give Dr. Lamont Gray a warm round of applause. Dr. Gray. So first, I want to give all the honor and glory to God. You know, my homelessness started in California over 25 years ago, you know, after I got out of the Navy. Drug addiction, crack cocaine, meth, you know, I was institutionalized for six months, uh, dealing with depression, suicidal ideation, probably had every diagnosis there was to man, right? And statistically, I should either be in prison or dead, because I was wilding out big time. And I remember, because I grew up in that old country, South Carolina, that old time religion. And I remember growing up how the elders would sing this song, and, and I don't have a song voice, so I'm going to try to sing a piece of it for y'all. And, and, and I think about that often. As a child, I didn't understand when the elders sung this song, that song, but now I do. And it would go like this. If it had not been for the Lord by my side, where would I be? Oh, where would I be? Thank you. I also want to dedicate this speech to Max. Max is uh, someone who was part of our community power network, also a person with lived experience, and he died by suicide last year. And uh, just a tremendous, amazing, bright individual. He actually coined the term pale, prejudice against lived experience. You know, and it was the, the systemic, the systems that killed him, having to beg and scrape for services and all of those things. I also want to dedicate this speech to all of our ancestors, especially my great-grandmother, Mama Jeannie, who would tell the story of her mama's mama in the cotton fields. And uh, she said, the rain would wet me and the sun would dry me. And I would pray out to God, please don't let my churn or my churn churn have to go what I went through. So I just want to thank my Mama Jeannie and all our ancestors' prayers for us to be where we are today. And of course, I gotta dedicate this to my family, the Washington State Lived Experience Coalition. They bring me life, they're a part of my recovery, they're a family, we struggle together, we get butt wild and messy, but <laughs> all this work is messy. But we, but we hang in there with each other, and I just love the LEC, the Lived Experience Coalition. And we gotta thank Destination Home, Jennifer and Claudine and their team. And my mentor, the good brother, Don Whitehead, and Megan, and the folks at National Coalition for the Homeless. So as you all know, we are here together at a critical moment, a turning point. This is no ordinary time, and this is no ordinary gathering. The tides of history are pushing against us. And the forces that uphold injustice and inequality are gathering. We've seen it in the aftermath of this recent election, a time when those in power have drawn clearer lines, dug in their heels, and continued the relentless march to criminalize homeless 
to blame the most vulnerable, and to ignore the fundamental dignity of human life. But y'all, we are not helpless. We are not voiceless, and we are not alone. Today, as we gather in this room, we gather as survivors. We gather as community organizers. We gather as poets, artists, and cultural workers. We gather as people with lived and living experiences of who know firsthand what it means to fight, to suffer, and to survive. We know what it's like to be unseen, unheard, and underestimated. And y'all know what? That's our power. Because we are the voices of truth. We are the voices that will not be ignored any longer. In this moment, and you've heard Donald say it, you've heard Alex, everyone has been saying it, but we need to unite like never before. Not just as those who have experienced homelessness, but as all who have faced the weight of oppression, marginalization, and prejudice, we are stronger together than we are alone. And we must now reach across every line that seeks to divide us. Whether we are black, brown, Asian, indigenous, Native American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, or white. Whether we are Republican, Democrat, Green Party, or Socialist. Whether we are Christian, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, or pagan. Whether you are poor and working class, LGBTQ, two-spirit, disabled, poor, young or old. If we have felt the sting of discrimination, if we couldn't get access to quality health and mental health care, if we have been criminalized for trying to survive, if we had to work a job where our labor was exploited, then our fates are bound together. This fight is not just a fight for those without homes. It is a fight for every person who has ever been told that their life matters less. And make no mistake, our power is real. Look around this room. Look around this room. There is strength here. There is courage here. There is hope here. There is love here. We know how to organize. We know how to speak up. And we know how to demand change. Because when we lift our voices together, we are unstoppable. We can hold those in power accountable. We can demand policies that protect rather than punish. And we can build a movement that refuses to let anyone fall through the cracks. We stand on the shoulders of those who fought for freedom, for civil rights, for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights, for justice, for dignity. They faced beatings, lynchings, arrests, humiliation, and worse. They were told to sit down, shut up, to accept their place. But they did not, and neither will we. We will not accept a world where people are thrown away where lives are valued based on wealth, and where the solution to homelessness is a pair of handcuffs. We know better and we demand better. As Donald mentioned, our power is in our unity. This is a time that demands everything from us, our courage, our conviction, our unity. We are standing at the edge of history. And I want to make this clear. Nothing will change if we just sit on the sidelines, you know? As Frederick, Frederick Douglass said, and, and Donald mentioned this earlier too, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Those words, those words ring true now as they were then. Power doesn't move because it sees us suffering, right? Power doesn't give because all of a sudden it grows a conscience. It only bends when we force it to bend. Right. And it only concedes when we rise up and demand it. Let me be clear, right here, right now, 
Our unity is the only thing that can counter the forces coming down on us. Those who hold power know that the only thing they have to fear is us. All of us. United in purpose, standing shoulder to shoulder, refusing to be divided. They fear us because our unity is the one thing they can't buy off. Control or silence. And y'all know what? Our unity is their kryptonite. Our unity is their kryptonite. Now, they're going to do everything in their power to break us. And right now we can see that, right? We see how systems of power are doubling down. Project 2025. How the powerful are working to put us against one another, to sow seeds of mistrust, to exploit our differences, to create fractures in our movement. They want us fighting each other instead of fighting them. But we cannot fall into that trap. We cannot afford the luxury of division and bickering and infighting. Not when people's lives are on the line. Not when they are criminalizing homelessness, pushing people out, and treating poverty like a crime and letting those on the mar margins suffer without recourse. Y'all, if we are gonna win this fight, then we gotta make a choice today. And that gotta be a choice for unity. We gotta put aside our differences and leave deep behind our egos and remember why we're here. We're not here for titles or credit, our own private agendas. And that's the thing, a lot of times in this movement, we each wanna start our own little private rut. Right? We need to come together powerfully. We are here for every single person who's been cast aside, neglected, criminalized simply for surviving. We are here for our brothers, our sisters, our non-gender binary siblings, our elders, and our children who deserve better than what this system gives them. We are here to demand justice, dignity, and freedom. But let's be really real. We are not going to be handed freedom, y'all. No one is going to gift us justice on a silver platter. It will only come when we demand it together as one unstoppable force. When we are united, we can take on anything. We can topple unjust laws. We can break down walls of discrimination and dismantle policies that target the most vulnerable among us. But that power only exists when we stand together, when we refuse to let anything divide us. When we speak with one voice, y'all, make no mistake, the halls of power tremble. And LAC, we saw this, right? When, when we had people lined up at public comment, but the system meant for good, for evil, got turned into good, right? When we show up in numbers, they will listen. Right? They know what we can accomplish when we're united in numbers. They know that when we demand change, they will have no choice but to listen. Right? We'll camp outside City Hall. Right? Zanita can tell you about that when they tried to kick that gentleman out of purpose supportive housing. What did you tell him? We're part of a coalition. Right? He wants to camp outside your building. They found him a new purpose supportive housing spot. <laughs> That's why our unity is so critical. It's our weapon, our shield, and our strength. Right? So we gotta reach out to every community, y'all, facing injustice, and we gotta come together. Right? We gotta call in the faith communities, racial justice organizations, disability right groups, immigrant groups. We all gotta work together now in numbers. And every person who believes in a just and fair world to rise up now so we can demand that our leaders put an end to the policies that criminalize homelessness, that push people out of their communities and treat poverty like a crime. So, I'm gonna get y'all permission. Can I get a little bit messy for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Leo. Now, I don't be messy just to be messy. But you know what? We gotta get a little messy, right? This work is messy. There's a little bit of drama, trauma. What did, what did Keisha say? EBT? At the open mic, y'all missed a wonderful open mic. He should say, EBT, everybody traumatized. <laughs> so, so, none of us are special in our trauma. 
right? And we talk about being trauma-informed, but we don't want to be trauma-driven, because we are more than our trauma, right? So we're going to get messy for a little bit. We're going to talk about something that's a force. And in the LEC, the Lived Experience Coalition in Washington State, we know this well. And I know many of you in this room know this well, too. So there is a force that is threatening to break us, right? And it's not from the outside, but from within us. I'm talking about, y'all get ready, internalized oppression. That is the enemy to our unity, right? Internalized oppression. Now, you can have internalized racism, internalized sexism, internalized ableism, right? And, and there's three sides of that coin to internalized oppression. You might have a sense of internalized superiority. You might have a sense of internalized inferiority. And some of us, we stand right in the middle. When we are facing one group, we might feel a sense of internalized inferiority. But then, the other group that we might be more lighter than, or et cetera, et cetera, we will feel a sense of internalized superiority, right? Now, all of it is an illness. No matter if it's superior, inferior, or somewhere in between, it's all an illness that all of us are on a journey of healing from, right? But this internalized oppression, and, and what I'm talking about is the ways, the lies, and injustices of this world can seep into our minds and hearts. And with epigenetics, they've discovered that we can actually pass on the trauma, right? And so this internalized oppression is what makes us question each other, compete with each other, and sometimes even turn against each other. Whether it's internalized racism, ableism, sexism, or any other form of oppression, it's a poison. A poison that creeps in quietly, and if we're not vigilant, it will tear apart our movement and our coalition building, and the unity that we need to win. So let me be crystal clear that the forces that want to keep us divided, they're thriving in our division. That's an old strategy, what they call the old okie doke right? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, right? They've been doing this for a long time. Divide and conquer. And so, the criminalization of homelessness, the punishment of people just for surviving, those who stand to gain from these unjust systems fear nothing more than our unity. They fear us working together side by side across lines of race, ability, gender, class, and identity, because they know that our unity is their end. We can't be flamboyant anymore. Now just look at that Supreme Court overturning the Grants Pass decision an outrageous blow to our movement. They're giving cities, cities across this country the green light to criminalize poverty, to criminalize people simply for having nowhere to go. This decision is a brutal reminder that those in power, they're not just indifferent, they are actively working to push people further into the nothingness, to erase us from view, to silence us, and if we let ourselves fall into infighting, if we let internalized oppression pit us against one another, we are playing right into their hands. Internalized oppression makes us see one another as competitors rather than comrades. It makes us suspicious when we should be lifting each other up. And I'm not trying to preach it, y'all. I, I fall for this. I'm dealing with my mess all the time. So I'm not trying to preach it, y'all. This is what I'm trying to learn for myself, right? And it makes us ask the question, is there enough room for me? When we know deep down there's enough room for all of us. Internalized racism, for instance, can drive a wedge between people of color, making us feel like we're fighting for scraps, but we should be demanding the whole table. Internalized ableism can make some of us feel weak for asking for what we need, while others feel resentful because they've been conditioned, they've been conditioned to tough it out alone. But 
There is no room for these divisions in our movement. When we allow them to linger and fester, we hand over our strength, our power, our potential. And let me tell you, our potential is the one thing that those in power cannot fabricate, cannot replicate, cannot buy, and cannot control. And when we stand together as people with lived experience of homelessness, people who have survived every form of inhumanity, and people who are unapologetically demanding justice, we are an unstoppable force. So I'm asking all of us to rise and embrace a higher standard. I'm calling us to see the lies of internalized oppression for what they are, distractions from the work we are called to do, that we can choose unity over competition, trust over suspicion, compassion over judgment, and healing over resentment. I'm calling for us to be vigilant against anything that tries to weaken the solidarity we've built. And I'm also calling for us to move away from calling each other out to calling each other in. And I've learned this recently, you know, the Ray Ross, she writes about this. You know, we get a little piece of wokeism and then we're ready to weaponize. Everybody calling each other out and whoop de whoop, whoop de whoop, and you this and you that. It's a hot mess. And we got, the, we got the language to call each other out and we be waiting. <laughs> And, and, and we do need to be called out, right? Or I should say called in. But uh, Mary Flowers, one of our mentors, she says that there's a difference between truth and honesty. So a lot of times we speak in our truth, but we're not being honest. We got some poison. We speak in the truth, but we want to do some harm too. We want to put that person in their place, right? We're, we're calling in. You still speak in your truth, but it's honest, right? and you're trying to cultivate a compassionate connection. So, and in this struggle together, our stuff is gonna come out, y'all. But we need to practice calling in instead of calling out. Right. So, let's all make a commitment to guard that unity like our very lives depend on it. Let's make a commitment to forgive and love on each other more. Together, we can heal our trauma. We can shatter the myths that keep us divided. We can push back against every policy that treats poverty like a crime, and together we can build a movement that's not just powerful, but unstoppable. We have the fire, we have the purpose, and most importantly, we have God on our side. They may have the power, but we have the people. Let's go and remind them of what we are capable of. Thank you. my sister Kawana to come up, uh, Kawana Hughes, and she is going to share us another beautiful poetry spoken word. So let's give it up for Kawana Hughes. So I'm going to share this uh, Black History piece I wrote this year that I feel like very prevalent to what we're getting ready to go through. I stand on the backs and bones of ancestors long gone, sing songs of names unknown because we were washed away with the waves, slaves given ocean graves, lost at sea, all of us stripped of our identity, middle passage was a savage beast, helping us become our own worst enemy. Helping the man disband our plans on the sands of our own shores, we open the door and let the devil in. Let him classify us by the hues of our skin, physically and mentally rape us again and again and again. Hurting us like cattle, forcing us to battle demons that never sought us out. Raped our men and turned us out, bent us over to break us in, then ripped us of our kin and told us we weren't fit to be classified as men. Three-fifths of a human is what they said we were reduced to. Beat us when we didn't do what you told us to. 
Brick by brick, stone by stone, America was built on my ancestors' bones. A land, a land that has never allowed us to call it home. Blood, sweat, and tears, and it still took two more years from the time we were declared free for word to spread throughout this country. But our freedom wasn't free. We dug the mass graves of the slaves who paved the way, worked our fingers to the bone day after day, and engraved the stones that held the bones of those who succumbed and became America's prey. But what did it mean to be free? We'd already lost our identities, so we were forced to use the ones they gave us, re-enslaving us, branding us by the names they handed to us, black, colored, negro, nigger, a melanin, a trigger for society to figure that we have no worth. Second class citizens who should be last and never first. Back of the bus for us. Sit in so we can stand. Trophies for the Ku Klux Klan. We were the strange fruit hanging from the trees. Our life was body swaying with the breeze. We were the little boy that was killed for a whistle. The four little girls bombed while praying in Sunday school. Crosses burned on our lawns from dusk till dawn, but still, but still we marched on. From valleys to mountaintops, stood together so we couldn't be stopped, not even Selma on Bloody Sunday could keep us away. From attempting to let freedom ring, from letting our children fight to overcome, another day being lived America's way. Separate but equal is the lies they told us. Segregation was a must. I mean, how could they be seen sitting next to us on a bus or drinking water from the same fountain? They'd rather climb mountains than have to dine with those with dark skin. And God forbid they have a black friend, the whole world might come to an end. The military had to stand guard in the schoolyard for one little girl to change the world by attending a school where her skin got her ridiculed and ostracized again and again. We integrated the segregated halls and four walls of institutions designed to keep people who look like me behind and confine our minds to the information they wanted us to know. Mentally, they didn't want us to grow. They knew it could become some dangerous times if we just used our minds. So many of our forefathers became martyrs trying to make things better for our sons and daughters. But so many of you millennials don't see that. Plain, oh, you're so proud to be black, but know nothing of the history that comes along with that. Come on. Yeah. You all are making a mockery of those who paved the way, so y'all can say some of the ridiculous things that you say. You call yourself a man because you have a gun in your hand on your waistband, but then got your pants all down to your knees, and all you little girls who think showing all of your assets makes you an asset to society are sadly mistaken. I wish you all would awaken and see how far you've taken the race as a whole. You're doing exactly what they think we do. Put on a show for them to view. Shame on you. What's even sadder is all of you screaming, Black Lives Matter, but who do they matter to? Because you all are killing your brothers that look just like you. You all are self-starters who should want to be a part of changing the society we've come, to, we've come to know. We've come a long way, but we still have so far to go. Present day history tells us so. Ask Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, or Kim Carter. These individuals were someone's sons and daughters with service martyrs to remind us we haven't made it back to where we need to be, on our, on our thrones where we're supposed to be. So fix your crowns, stand proud, and wear your blackness out loud.